Gently nestled on a grassy hillside amid ten and a half rolling acres in the scenic Sugar Creek Valley, the Frank Lloyd Wright House in Ebsworth Park remains but one of only five Wright-designed structures in the entire state of Missouri. Recently listed on the National Register of Historic Places, the house is notable not only for its architectural integrity, but for the immaculate preservation of its original Wright-designed furnishings and fabrics. Remarkable in its dramatic sense of sighting, its varied use of materials, and efficient handling of interior space, the house defies convention in its every detail. The improbable story of its difficult construction and, decades later, rescued from the brink of almost certain redevelopment, is an inspiring tale of persistence over adversity. From its very beginning a genuine labor of love, the house was designed and gradually built over the course of the 1950s for resident St. Louisans Ruth and Russell Krauss. Russell Krauss, being uh, somebody very interested in art and professionally involved in it, was very much aware of Wright's work, but he never thought that he could afford a Frank Lloyd Wright house until he read an article that had been written by Lauren Pope, uh, a reporter for the Washington Star, who had been able to build a Frank Lloyd Wright Usonian house in Virginia. And he built this small house for $3,500 and all the beer he could provide on weekends. And I thought I could afford something like that. So we wrote to Mr. Wright and asked him if he would design a little house like that for us. Then many months went by and we thought, well, Mr. Wright isn't interested in designing a small house for the Krauses. When finally we got a letter through the mail from Mr. Wright saying that you shall have your little house. The little house that Wright had in mind for the Krauses would be liberally based on the architect's continuing Usonian ideal. Frank Lloyd Wright started to use the term Usonian in the early 1930s. It is uh, based on the uh, abbreviation for United States of North America, including the O in the of, and then I, I guess just adding the I to make it more pronounceable. The Usonian House was Wright's effort to provide good design for people of modest means. He wanted to do that by totally rethinking the concepts of what was a house. Uh, he was very interested in demonstrating that his theories and his philosophies could be applied to the small house, that, that he wasn't bigger than the common man, and demonstrated that through doing hundreds of small homes throughout America. One of uh, the parts of Wright's philosophy had to do with the fact that he lived on the prairie in, the, in Illinois and Wisconsin, and he saw the horizontal line as the most significant feature of the American landscape. He always emphasized the horizontal lines over the vertical lines, and uh, this was done through uh, cantilevered roof lines and balconies and even in the masonry so that the horizontal lines, be the joints between the bricks were emphasized whereas the vertical joints were minimized. Wright's Usonian homes typically focus on a large communal hearth-based living area. The kitchen is small, designed for use as a multi-purpose workspace. The house is set on a slab no basement, no attic. Instead of a garage, the architect provides a carport, always part of the house itself rather than a separate building in the backyard. Recognized as an excellent example of Wright's latter-day Usonian design, the Krauss home is further distinguished by some of the architect's most ambitious use of geometric design. It was one of the most complexly designed houses that Wright ever did in terms of its geometry. And it goes back to a theme that uh, Wright started to develop in the 1930s of uh, houses that were designed on other than right angles. Uh, in this case, a 60 and 120 degree parallelogram. He thought of a building as something that flowed, something that you moved through. It was a sense of movement 
So he was not going to be restricted by the sense of a block, of a building. So he broke the box apart, took the walls and moved them away from the square and began playing with geometries that were dynamic, that were closed, that were open. And he did that with spaces internally within a home. While Russell Krauss himself was thrilled with the final plans for his Usonian-styled home, local contractors were not so quick to share his enthusiasm. The problem was that no contractor in St. Louis was willing to uh, tackle the design because it had so many features that they were unfamiliar with. We couldn't find a builder who was wanting to build it. Uh, it was all too complicated and they weren't interested in something that was unusual. Krauss eventually hired Lee Patterson, an ambitious young Korean war vet hoping to escape his father's kitchen remodeling business. It was a challenge, that's why I got interested. I mean, I was just always that way. Anything somebody told me couldn't be done, I, I was gonna do it, you know, show them. And uh, when, when Russell couldn't find a builder anywhere to tackle the job when they'd look at it, why, that's what made me really interested in it. Lee Patterson was a very able contractor, but even he had trouble meeting some of Wright's specifications. For example, the uh, corner bricks had to be parallelogram shaped, and it took them several months to find a brick making company that could make the shape that they needed. Then another specification called for Tidewater Red Cypress, which is a wonderful uh, moisture resistant wood, but unfortunately had been largely depleted from American forests during World War II. So uh, they wrote and called and uh, checked all over the country, really, to find the wood that they needed for this house. With one problem after another, construction dragged on and on. For the Krauses, it was a long, lonely battle, over 10 years from conception to completion. And even then... When we moved in, the house really wasn't complete. But through the uh, succeeding years, we, we did manage to get a little bit done here and a little bit done there before the house reached what might be considered a, a finished stage. And we just thought it was beautiful. It was just beyond our, our most fantastic dream. And so, yes, we, we were very pleased with, Mr. with what Mr. Wright had, had built for us, and we certainly let him know. In many respects, construction of the Krauss's little house was never fully completed. Still, the experience of living here inspired in Russell and Ruth, who died in 1992, a sense of joy that rarely flagged over the course of nearly five decades. But finally, an inevitable realization. Russell Krauss would have to let his treasure go. Russell was interested in the money that he might get from selling the house, but he held off because he loved the house and he recognized that it was exceptionally significant. He almost had tears in his eyes the way he talked about the house and this reverence he had for Frank Lloyd Wright. And he, he, he just had such a love of the house and I really had the feeling he didn't, in many ways he didn't want to let it go. Developers were coming by all the time and he had to do something because uh, he couldn't afford to stay here. Fortunately, a solution was at hand, thanks to the efforts of an intrigued group of local citizens, joined and eventually organized by Joanne Cohn. I became involved through my friendship with Judith Bettendorf, an interior designer and artist from St. Louis who wanted to live in a Frank Lloyd Wright house. And so she gathered together some friends, and Mr. Krauss showed us the house. And uh, they decided that if I would be willing to sell, they would like to form a, a conservancy to buy the house and preserve it as a Frank Lloyd Wright Museum. And I said, oh, that would just be great. I would be so happy if that could be done. In 1995, the group established themselves as a nonprofit organization. Then, two years later, 
Judith Bettendorf moved to Florida, ceding the group's leadership to Joanne Cohen. I didn't want the project to fall away when Judith left. I felt that this was a unique opportunity to save something that could be lost. The organization got a huge boost in 1999 when the Whitaker Foundation pledged a lead gift of $500,000. That same year, Barney Ebsworth agreed to pledge $1 million, and subsequently, the park was named in memory of his parents. With these substantial commitments now secured, the final pieces of the puzzle began to fall in place. Somewhere along the line, each person responsible for every dollar that was put in to this project came to believe in the project. And that's what made it happen. On January 18, 2001, with private funding finally in hand, the nonprofit organization completed an eight-year effort by officially purchasing the 10 and a half acre property, house, Frank Lloyd Wright furniture, and the memorabilia collected by Russell Krauss for $1.7 million. Then, in a unique financial arrangement, the group immediately donated the entire purchase to St. Louis County, which, in turn, leased it to the nonprofit for 50 years. At its option, the nonprofit can extend the lease for three additional 50 year periods. Uh, the idea there being that, uh, first off, we would give it life in perpetuity by turning it over to the county as a county park. And secondly, we would take the burden of, uh, of operational cost away from the county and put it with the nonprofit. The responsibilities for the St. Louis County, of course, are going to be the grounds, the turf, the turf maintenance. Once the roadway has been um, asphalted or concrete, concreted in, snow removal responsibilities will be that of St. Louis County Parks and assisting with the forestry tree operations. We've met our goal. You know, it took us a long time. But by holding up high standards and never accepting anything, that wouldn't meet our vision, we saved this house. 50 and 9 16 strong. Saving the house was one thing. The accompanying challenge, restoring it, proved to be quite another. The condition of the house was quite questionable. We weren't quite sure how many structural problems we had. The brick walls were all deteriorating from just the elements, uh, the water getting behind them, freezing and thawing. It was just really in very, very bad repair. With a pledge from the Gateway Foundation earmarked specifically for restoration, work began immediately. The project was guided by John Eifler, a respected Chicago architect known for his expertise in the restoration of Frank Lloyd Wright Usonian homes. We really wanted someone who had a background in Frank Lloyd Wright because we needed the guidance. We knew how to make the house look good, but we wanted it to be a house museum. We wanted to use museum standards. Achieving museum quality standards for the house, furniture, and fabrics in a Frank Lloyd Wright restoration requires painstaking attention to detail. We were very lucky that Russell Krauss was his own curator. He valued Frank Lloyd Wright to the point that he wouldn't change anything or add anything to this house without Wright's permission or the permission of the architects from Taliesin. The exceptional thing about the Krauss house is it has all the original contents, the furnishings, the light fixtures, the fabrics that Frank Lloyd Wright specified. To find that in a Frank Lloyd Wright house is very rare today. Passion, pride, perseverance. The lasting imprint of an American master's inspired handiwork. Preserved here, on view for all. I think for St. Louisans, uh, having this house available to view and inspire them is uh, very important to the whole architectural uh, ambience of the community. To come here 
for the first time and see everything is preserved. Everything is the way that Frank Lloyd Wright intended for it to be. Is just, you know, it's just such a treasure. We just don't see this anymore. A treasure, yes, along with the dream of a new visitor center, all part of preserving the legacy, a legacy demanding fresh commitment to new responsibilities. I think it's a cultural institution, and we're developing it as a cultural institution. And we want to build programs around this house that will serve the public to be dedicated to good design and interest in architecture that I think will reflect on all of the architecture in St. Louis. And that's the legacy 